Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, um, and welcome to our Vincent series of webinars on issues in the accounting world. Um, today's webinar will be on uh, Phoenix activity. Um, my name is Damien Davis. I'm an associate director here at in, uh, Vincent's um, in the Insolvency and Reconstruction Division. And I will be your pilot today on our wonderful journey through the world of Phoenix activities and what exactly the government is doing to attempt to combat Phoenix activities. Um, uh, and also um, what in the industry, both legal and accounting, uh, feels in relation to uh, the likelihood that uh, the government's current steps will be successful in dealing with Phoenix activity. Um, should you have any questions at any point in time during the presentation, feel free to ask. Um, outside of that, um, my contact details are available um, as part of the presentation and I always welcome a call from anybody who wishes to discuss um, anything in relation to today's presentation or anything just generally in relation to the world of insolvency um queries whatever else more than happy to discuss them um and provide whatever help i may be able to provide to you um usual disclaimer uh regarding the content of today's presentation um although personally i think that it's fairly reasonable advice and you can follow it with due respect having written it myself um there you go, you can check my ID. Um, I am who I am. So, um, in relation to today's presentation, um, we are going to deal with, as I said, four questions. Uh, firstly, what is Phoenixing? Um, secondly, what is being done about it by the government um, and the various regulatory bodies? Um, Thirdly, what are uh, the criticisms of the new legislation that has been introduced to Parliament in uh, February of this year um, and is due to be voted on, I guess, in the next couple of weeks? Um, and fourthly, um, what possible future steps could the government take um, to strengthen um, the anti-phoenixing legislation within Australia? Um, as I think you can see from um, the last two uh, topics, um, there is a great deal of criticism that still exists in relation to um, the government's lack of action um, in relation to the Phoenix activity. Um, and there are certainly plenty of suggestions as to what could be done to further strengthen those, uh, those laws. Um, so we will go through both of those particular issues. Um, so, what is phoenixing? Well, long and short of it, um, it's where a company director um, will effectively strip a company of its assets um, immediately prior to liquidation um, and basically transfer them usually to a related entity um, or to a co-company um, and essentially leave the original company with no assets, a whole heap of liabilities, um, and no way to um, meet any of those liabilities once a liquidator is appointed. Um, it's a practice that is as old as time itself. Um, I've been doing insolvency for more or less 20 years. Uh, and on day one, I dealt with a Phoenix company and I've probably got another 15 to 20 phoenixes or close to phoenixes um, sitting on my current ledger at the moment, which I am attempting to deal with. Um, it has been a long criticism of uh, liquidators. Um, and I guess in recent years with the um, predominance of pre-insolvency advisors, um, it's a, uh, a problem that is becoming more and more prevalent um, within our industry um, as advisors sort of have an opportunity to deal with the company's assets and to, um, you know, put themselves in a position to try to protect um, the effectively the directors 
asset position um, and or business prior to an insolvency administrator being appointed, particularly in instances like court liquidations or, or creditors' voluntary liquidations. So um, the key issue of Phoenix Inc. is that it isn't defined um, in the Corporations Act, um, nor is it defined in other acts um, uh, of an associated nature. Um, and its activities themselves aren't necessarily um, illegal. Um, the idea of transferring out assets from a company that is in financial difficulty in itself um, doesn't necessarily constitute an offence. Um, the key issue in respect of that matter is that um, such assets should be transferred out at fair market value. Um, thereby leaving behind um, you know, the proceeds of, of for the sale or acquisition of those assets for the liquidator to distribute to creditors in the event that the liquidation occurs. Um, so it's really, phoenixing itself is actually the, the act of stripping out those assets for less than or for nil market value um, and uh, basically leaving creditors with uh, no actual recoverable position. Um, the reason to a major extent why it becomes difficult um, is effectively that there's little or no money left over um, for a liquidator to obviously recover money for uh, creditors, but also for a liquidator to undertake uh, appropriate investigations in respect of um, companies uh, that have been phoenixed. Um, and basically the way in which the Corporations Act works is that if a liquidator um, has no foreseeable um, method of recovery for his fees or for any costs that are associated with that particular undertaking, um, then the liquidator is not obliged to um, pursue uh, ongoing and, and potentially quite costly investigations and or um, litigation. And really that's where it's at. Uh, quite a few liquidators will um, do their best to pursue um, companies where we see instances of phoenixing um, and uh, certainly put pressure on uh, the directors that are involved to um, try to uh, recover money, be that through claims of insolvent trading or uh, uncommercial transactions or director related transactions as the case may be appropriate. Um, but it becomes much of an issue when effectively a director's response to such actions is just generally, that's fine, take legal action against me. Um, and then for a liquidator, he's either got to sort of negotiate with a lawyer to take the matter on spec, or alternatively, he's reaching into his own pocket effectively to um, fund any of those litigations, particularly if there is adverse cost orders. Um, and look, the reality is, is that in those circumstances, a liquidator is particularly unlikely to wish to put his hand in his own pocket and to expose himself to those sorts of costs. Um, so the reality comes down is that effectively in these particular instances, what usually happens is the liquidator um, does his investigations, will sort of sit there and say, okay, it's pretty obvious that this thing's been phoenixed off. There's no recoveries available for creditors. There's no recoveries available anywhere else. Um, the director's off there, you know, effectively running his new business under a new name um, and incurring debts. Um, the assets have all been transferred. Um, I'm going to prepare a report to ASIC, um, which effectively details that this is exactly what's happened. Um, in the event that there are employee entitlements outstanding, they may be covered by FEG. Um, outside of that, you know, there's significant shortfalls to the Australian Taxation Office and superannuation and, and whatnot else. Um, we issue the report to ASIC and look, to be perfectly frank with you, in 99.95% .9 of cases, ASIC just sort of says, yep, noted, duly noted, um, and we will continue to, you know, basically not do anything um, and the liquidator, uh, the director gets away with the circumstances, the liquidator deregisters the old company, um, creditors don't get anything, director's got a new company um, and he's off off to the races. Um, 
ARETA being the um, regulatory body for insolvency practitioners um, have frequently stated um, that it's not really an issue of what is lacking in the law. We do have options. They're not the best options in the world, but you know we do have options to look at director related transactions and uncommercial transactions relating to the transfer of those assets. But the reality is there's just a lack of enforcement, a lack of prosecution. And the reality is that any particular penalty in, incurred um, on a director is a, a relatively low level. And as an example of that, I'd probably look back at um, a matter that I did uh, probably going back almost a decade now. Um, there is an Australian clothing manufacturer, or there was an Australian clothing manufacturer called Subi, um, and it was a sort of high-end clothing manufacturer. It sold um, clothing not only in Australia, but sort of around the world. It had stores in Japan and the US and whatnot else. Um, its directors weren't the, the best. Um, they were fantastic clothing designers, not exactly the world's best uh, accountants and managers of companies. Um, put themselves in a financial position. Um, they had a clothing distributor who was sort of a much lower level um, clothing distributor, sort of more, much more generalized fashion, but saw that there was some value associated with the um, title, um, the Subi brand, um, and they, they acquired um, the Subi brand from these particular directors um, with the support of the bank, et cetera, et cetera. Um, now, over the course of that occurred in 2010, and oh, I was involved in that process in facilitating that particular um, transaction, the director of the lower level clothing brand who acquired the Subi brand um, was a gentleman by the name of Mark Byers. Um, over the course of the next, I believe, four years, um, he placed four companies into liquidation and in all instances basically transferred out the Subi brand for effectively no consideration um, into the new entity. So he put the old entity into liquidation, would rack up debts in it, and then basically just liquidate it, transfer out the brand, no consideration, said it wasn't worth anything if nobody was obviously going to do anything with it, and would then start up the new entity and effectively trade and incur debts and off we off we went he did it four times um it wasn't until effectively the fifth liquidation that he'd been involved in in the space of less than i believe four years um that asic actually took action against him and the effect of that action was that he was banned from acting as a director for a period of five years which in reality isn't exactly a major penalty um, you know, obviously he was still able to, and I know that he did still work within his clothing conglomerate, um, just not as a director. Um, he still received a significant amount of pay. Um, and effectively as of this year, he'll, he'll be outside of his banning notice, um, and able to go back to being a director, um, again, of a new entity. So, um, for him, you know, the financial windfalls in terms of, continuing to be able to use that brand name um, were significant and the penalty that was associated with him incurring all these debts and constantly um, putting companies in liquidation was basically minimal. Um, and, you know, the reality is, is that a lot of the people who engage in this activity, um, you know, it's not their first time around, um, particularly the advisors that are associated with them, you know, even if it is, you know, the actual director's first time around, it's not the advisor's first time around. Um, they will have done it many, many, many times and literally have no sort of consequence in terms of um, what the actual repercussions are on them because um, effectively there aren't any. Um, and, you know, it's just a, a practice that continues to snowball. Um, it's a practice that's prevalent in quite a few industries, uh, construction industry being one that's been recently identified as a significant problem. Um, so as I say, you know, the, the directors are mostly um, liable to director banning notices. Um, underneath the Corporations Act, there are criminal penalties as well, criminal um, fines that can be imposed upon a director. But they're limited to about 2,000 penalty units, which is ballpark $400,000. Um, 
and depending on obviously the type of assets you've got and the you know background that you have for that company the ability to transfer um, those assets and continue the trading on in a new entity can quite easily um, outweigh that sort of cost um, relationship um, as I say there's really not um, it hasn't been a successful prosecution um, of third parties that are associated um, in that particular in the process um, you know really um, the circumstances in which it's happened are um, you know particularly where the the um, the uh, offending has been flamboyant or egregious um, you know Philip Whiteman in Melbourne recently um, there's also been a couple of pre-insolvency administrators down the Gold Coast who have recently been charged with criminal offences associated with that particular process. Um, but in relation to both those processes, um, most of the, or certainly a good chunk of the criminal charges that have been brought against those people have been um, as a result of fraud um, and the distribution of proceeds of crime. So they're not purely... Um, as a result of them actually undertaking those Phoenix activities, they're more, um, you know, transactions that occurred associated with the Phoenix activities as opposed to the Phoenix activities themselves. Um, so it, it, it's very difficult um, to um, basically hold pre insolvency advisors, accountants, lawyers, um, those people that sort of recommend this, this strategy um, to hold them responsible in relation to it. And as I say, you know, the reality is once they've done it once, they'll do it constantly because there just are no consequences and it's really just the most simple way of dealing with things. Um, as I say, from our perspective as liquidators, really the only thing that we have available to us, um, particularly as there are there is no funding to, you know, pursue legal action against these parties, is to prepare a report um, to ASIC and sort of basically highlight the issue to them and effectively, you know, they'll either take action or they won't. And the reality is in the majority of circumstances, they just don't. Um, you know, one of the things that perhaps is a good example of that is that underneath the Act, at Section 596AB of the Corporations Act, there is currently a provision that allows ASIC um, and for other parties to take criminal action against people who deliberately um, tank companies and transfer out assets, leaving behind employee entitlements. Um, the reality is, and you know, this has been subject, this section has been subject to study, it's never been used. Um, it just, you know, even though it exists and the circumstances as far as tanking companies exist and have existed for a long, long time, um, that section has never been used to prosecute any particular party so um that's a fair example of just how um little enforcement sort of occurs rightly or wrongly um in respect of these particular issues you really have to have an egregious position very often that position that egregious position has to flow on to you know other crimes such as fraud or uh, again dealing with the proceeds of crime before you're going to you know, drag yourself up in front of a, um, or have ASIC sort of drag you up and actually take criminal proceedings against you in relation to this particular uh, offence. So um, what has happened um, in recent years, I, I guess over the last five years, um, the idea of phoenixing has become more and more prevalent. Um, there was a study that was done about two years ago, um, which sort of estimated that the cost of phoenixing to the Australian economy was somewhere between effectively 3 million and 5 million, 5 billion rather, dollars per year. Um, that's obviously a significant gap. Um, there's a lot of flow on effects with phoenixing. Um, you know, it, it has a, a damaging effect upon a business's competitiveness. Um, it has a damaging effect on insurance rates. It has a damaging effect on a number of other flow on effects, um, you know, associated with uh, with businesses, commercial credit, um, all those sorts of issues. So, uh, 
it's very hard to sort of nail down an, an exact number, but as I say, the you know the rough estimates are somewhere between three and five billion dollars per year. Um, in terms of uh, impact, and that's, you know, it comes from taxes, loss of taxes, that comes from the loss of a whole lot of things. Um, as I say, in the last three to five years, there's been sort of a push to actually deal with it. Um, a number of phoenixing um, black market um, and fraud tax forces have been set up, and they're sort of generally um, combined under what would be called a phoenix task force which effectively has been set towards uh, both state and federal um, bodies sort of sharing information um, and recommending um, avenues that can be pursued to sort of further police this particular problem. Um, you know, obviously ASIC, ATO, um, the various state departments for jobs and small businesses uh, uh, and the fair trading departments are sort of the key leaders in this sort of uh, field, but, you know, there's also contributions from things like uh, building commissions, you know, the Queensland um, building uh, services, um, the various state level building services, Motor Vehicle Dealers Act, um, a lot of, you know, more industry based um, groups are also becoming involved in it. FEG, um, as the provider of employee entitlements are, are very much becoming involved in it. You know, their shift in the last five years has gone from effectively just handing out employee entitlements and dealing with those things to now a very um, market change towards actually recovering and seeking to take steps to recover um, employee entitlements that have been issued on behalf of liquidators. You know, five years ago, you probably wouldn't have seen the level of effort that's been put into, say, Clive Palmer at the moment by FAG in terms of recovering money for employee entitlements paid in relation to Queensland Nickel. Um, that's, that has, uh, that focus has certainly shifted. Um, I expect that that will become even more market over the next five years. Um, the reality of the circumstance is that um, these issues become important to government bodies as and when there are economic downturns. We haven't really had one in Australia for a long time. Um, and so, you know, when there is that economic downturn um, and there is a, particularly when there's a gap between what people expect liquidators to recover and what is actually recovered by liquidators because of these issues like phoenixing, um, that's when you start to see that the government sort of takes the steps seriously. Um, and it's certainly arguable within the profession that effectively the ramping up that they're doing at the moment is a preemptive step towards, um, obviously, the view that, you know, over the next few years, the economy um, at a corporate level may sort of encounter some bumpiness, um, let us say, and uh, there will be quite a few entities that will be potentially looking at uh, going down the Phoenix in route. So, as I say, what's been done about it? Well, the reality is um, in February of 2019, there was a bill introduced, um, which is effectively to modify the Corporations Act. Um, it has, you know, one of these uh, wonderful titles, um, the Treasury Laws Amendment Combating Illegal Activity, Illegal Phoenixing Bill of 2019. Um, it's due back from committee effectively in the next couple of days, actually next week. Um, and I expect it to pass pretty much into law um, during the course of April. There's not really too much of a problem there with it. Um, you know, the issues that have been raised by the various regulatory bodies in relation to problems with it have been on foot for, I don't know, at least two years. Um, and, you know, the, the reality is the legislation is what the legislation is and they're not really going to change it. They're just going to put it through. So what does it do? Um, the new legislation has probably five major um, components. It introduces a offence, um, which is specifically um, designed to tackle phoenixing, allegedly, um, which is effectively called credit, credit defeating dispositions. Um, and it'll be another voidable transaction that liquidators can pursue. Uh, 
Um, there are some issues associated with that and some sort of benefits and sort of easier methods of dealing with it that um, come accompanied with that. Um, it prevents directors from backdating their resignation from companies um, to, you know, uh, basically prevent themselves from becoming personally liable for certain debts. So you can't as director turn around and say, well, yeah, I was actually, I resigned as liquidator way back in 2018. Um, and therefore I'm not liable for the last six months worth of debt for insolvent trading, et cetera, et cetera. Um, that is something that is not uncommon. Um, you know, the, particularly um, the Whiteman matter highlights a number of circumstances where a number of companies um, obviously went before Philip um, and he had the existing directors resign, new patsy directors in some cases, they were just homeless people, um, effectively be put on as directors, not knowing anything about what, you know, the company was or being involved in or whatever else, being paid 50 bucks to be directors. And, um, you know, when a liquidator came along, you know, talking to somebody who had no idea what the business was about, no ability to pay any liabilities, et cetera, et cetera. The previous director has already resigned um, and basically turns around and says, well, I'm not accepting any responsibility for any of those debts, despite the fact that, you know, I traded during that period of time. So um, to a certain extent, this is a, um, a reaction to that particular position. Um, it prevents a sole director from resigning and leaving a company as an empty corporate shell with no director, um, with no director. Um, that has occurred quite a few times I've seen, um, and particularly sort of puts it in a position then when, um, which forces effectively a creditor to spend more money to go to court, to seek the approval of the court, to wind the, the process up, um, you know whatever that creditor is ends up spending another two or three thousand dollars in going down through that process liquidated the same the same position particularly where it's a related company um now the important things i guess um extends the director penalty provisions um and makes um, directors liable for gst and a number of other taxes um this is an extension of the existing Director penalty notices, which um, basically relate to outstanding superannuation. Um, so this is now an addition. This is sort of saying, hey, look, GST is, is also included on that. Um, it's a welcome position. You know, GST is one of these things where, you know, effectively the company collects the GST that it needs to remit to the government at some point in time. Um, and essentially what happens is the, liquid, the director just turns around and says, well, you know, I'm putting the company into liquidation. I've got that extra 10% credit um, sitting. I'm going to keep that money. Nobody else is getting it. Tax office doesn't get it, etc. cetera. Um, so that extends that provision and says, well, look, you're personally liable for that if you haven't paid it. Um, it also allows the tax. There's also a provision allowing the taxation office to withhold tax refunds um, from corporate entities and other entities where there are outstanding liabilities or in the event that there's outstanding information, again, sort of an enforcement process to um, prevent directors from effectively collecting the tax, not remitting it to the government um, and, uh, you know, taking off with it. So um, not unsurprisingly, a significant number of the amendments are basically to prevent money being ripped off from the government as opposed to money being ripped off from ordinary unsecured creditors, but that is what it is. If you want to get legislation changed, um, you really need the government to suffer. Um, so in terms of major um, uh, issues associated with the legislation, uh, credit defeating transactions is, is probably the, the key component. As I say, it's an introduced voidable transaction for liquidators to be able to pursue. Long and short of it, basically, if you, you um, dispose of an asset within 12 months um, prior to the liquidation or the voluntary administration um, and the company was insolvent or becomes insolvent as a result of that transfer, um, then you've created an offence. Um, the next step is then that the liquidator needs to be able to establish that the disposal occurred at less than the fair market value or best price reasonably obtainable. Um, for that particular asset. 
um, as an extra kicker, um, any party who um, who um, assists in that particular process can also be held uh, liable for an offence. Um, so uh, what that means is that effectively when people go about um, transferring out these assets and doing these restructurings, they need to have a proper valuation conducted of the assets that are associated with it. What we tend to find um, very often is that, you know, uh, physical assets themselves, they may be valued um, by an outside party, but, you know, they'll be valued at whatever the liquidation value is, um, not considering that effectively they're not being sold at a liquidation value, they're being sold at an ongoing business value um, because they're being transferred out of this one entity that's actually trading into a new entity that's going to continue trading, continue running the business. Um, we tend to find too that there's no consideration for associated costs, so things like rental bonds, um, et cetera, et cetera. The old entity had paid the rental bond um, for the premises, the new entity just transferred across the, the, the leasehold into its name. Um, the rental bond, you know, is still stuck there. They just, you know, continue on trading with that. Um, things like goodwill, you know, the, the view that um, that auctioneers tend to take is, well, as I say, you know, this is a liquidation scenario. The company would otherwise have gone in liquidation. It's now gone into this new entity. That entity continues on trading. There's no associated goodwill. There's no associated title. The reality is that's not the case. Um, you know, the businesses and the clients and the um, ongoing um, trade that the old entity had has just been shifted across to the new entity along with the assets. Um, and accordingly, there should be some degree of compensation associated with that. Um, so, you know, they're sorts of things that we look at as liquidators um, and seek to sort of say, well, you know, have you valued those particular aspects um, fairly? And if you haven't, then, you know, you're effectively undertaking a credit defeating transaction. Um, so these transactions attract both um, criminal and civil provisions. Um, as I say, they can be pursued against the parties who uh, procure, incite, induce or encourage a company to make um, credit defeating transactions. Um, we can seek to undo um, those transactions we effectively have three years um, uh, from our appointment as liquidators to pursue those sorts of actions. Um, ASIC can pursue those actions uh, themselves under their own initiative within a period of 12 months. Um, yeah, if they feel that liquidator is either A, not doing their job properly, or B, that, you know, the liquidator, there should be some degree of recovery, but the liquidator is unable to do so because of lack of funding effectively. Um, then ASIC can step in and take that particular role. Um, the second major part, I guess, of the new legislation is the powers of the tax office in terms of um, increasing its ability to recover its debts. Um, as I say, they're making people personally liable for GST, luxury car tax, wine equalization tax, and certain other um, tax liabilities. Um, again, it's a recovery um, system, particularly in cases where um, the company itself or the director themselves effectively receives the revenue that eventually has to flow into the tax office and just basically puts the company in liquidation, pockets that revenue and says, there you go. Um, so that's effectively what it's dealing with. It will be an extension of the director penalty notice terms um, in terms of, you know, the tax office has issues a direct penalty notice, you've got a period of time in which to deal with it. If you don't deal with that particular issue within that period of time, you become personally liable. So um, it will put emphasis upon directors to actually deal with their outstanding taxation obligations on a timely basis and also um, potentially uh, become liable even when they don't deal with those issues. Um, in terms of tax refunds, um, yeah, the tax office can basically prevent um, a taxpayer from recovering or a company from recovering tax refunds in the event that it has outstanding tax obligations. That, in reality, is just a reflection of exactly what exists in the Bankruptcy Act at the moment. As an individual, if you become bankrupt, uh, 
and you haven't lodged outstanding, you have a number of outstanding tax returns still to lodge, or um, you effectively have tax liabilities associated with other issues, such as, say, a directed penalty notice, you have a personal tax income um, refund due to you, the tax office will offset that tax refund against your other liabilities and you won't get paid it. So really just an extension of what you, what exists at a bankruptcy level to a corporate level. Um, so um, the other particular issue is there were some amendments brought in in December. Um, these are amendments uh, relating to related creditors and their rights at uh, creditors meetings. So what potentially was happening was that um, parties were acquiring debts from non-related parties um, and using those debts to effectively stack a vote, a resolution. Um, the amendments that were brought in in December of 2018 effectively say that um, the value for the debt um, that you can vote for at a creditors meeting has is equal to the value that you paid for that debt. So um, if I'm a related party, I wanted to get a vote through and I went to a third party and said, look, the reality is you're not going to get anything anyway. I'll give you 10 cents in the dollar on what you're owed. You give me the, that debt. I'll use that debt to vote and then, you know, force a vote through in the manner in which I expect. Um, the previous provisions allowed for you to claim for the full amount of the debt that was outstanding. So let's say it was $100,000, even though you don't ever pay $10,000 for it. The new legislation has changed that down to say, well, you're only allowed to prove for the $10,000 that you paid for that debt um, rather than the original $100,000. So effectively, you know, you're paying dollar for dollar if that's what you want to do as far as stacking these particular actions actions um you know this was something that happened um i wouldn't say that it happened a hell of a lot of occasions but um yeah it certainly was a provision that um the new amendments to the act allowed people to do um particularly with relation to the buying of preferences and the buying of various people's debts um so you know i i can't say that it's going to really change the world um for liquidators but it will limit um a certain number of transactions or a certain number of events um probably you know the, the most the most likely one is circumstances where um yeah a company is effectively going to go into a deed or um something along those those lines or a liquidator is appointed the related parties are un unhappy with that liquidator in terms of you know he's pursuing action against them and they want another liquidator who's more friendly quote unquote to be appointed, they can remove the existing liquidator. They're going to be the sorts of areas in which this particular issue is going to sort of um, have an effect. So criticisms of the draft legislation. Well, there's a few. Um, the reality of which, um, as I said before, as has been highlighted by Arita, is that essentially there's no funding for this, there's or there is very limited funding. Um, as a result of the new legislation, there is some improvement of what's known as the Asset List Administration Fund, which is a fund that ASIC has and which liquidators can draw upon to or apply to draw upon, um, in which to take action against liquidator against for egregious positions where they haven't got any money to be able to do it. They apply to ASIC and they say, well, look, this is egregious for these reasons. Um, and ASIC will sit there and say, okay, yeah, we're prepared to fund you for legal costs and for your own costs to take various steps, um, which can either be done directly by the liquidator themselves or hand in hand with ASIC um, uh, to pursue these actions. But the reality is that fund is still woefully inadequate. Um, we're talking, you know, less than $100 million available, significantly less than $100 million available um, for a problem that, you know, benefit, causes, you know, uh, in excess of $5 billion worth of damage to the economy. So it's not even in the ballpark. Um, 
you know, the, the, the terms associated with the um, idea of an assetless administration fund, they're long, they're complicated. Um, you know, whether or not ASIC will pursue an action is it's subject to some question. Um, it can be a process, so, you know, as an example, I made an application to the assetless administration fund in relation to one of my matters, made that application in August of last year. Um, ASIC still hasn't given me the authority um, to take steps in relation to that particular action. Um, you know, my position to ASIC was, well, you're going to need to do a public examination because effectively the director is destroyed all the records um, and what records that do exist, they're not making available to us. Um, we've been stonewalled by third parties. Um, and this is an instance where a director um, was subject to a banning notice. Um, at some point in time, registered a company that was had a very similar name to the company that was that I'm liquidator of. Um, they sold the company or sold the assets and business to the company that I'm liquidator of and basically just deposited the check into um, the, the entity with a very similar name that they were directors of despite being banned and then just shut the whole thing down. Cash flowed out, you know, and we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. Cash flowed out, no money left behind for the other creditors. You know, complete transaction that was, you know, completely and, you know, fraudulent from every step. Knew exactly what they were doing, took deliberate steps to ensure that, you know, um, they were protecting their own position and it's taken six months. There's significant arguments over whether we're going to be allowed to publicly examine people. You know, we pointed out that if we don't publicly examine people, we only have X amount of information and the grand total of which is, you know, um, and, and an ASIC have, have noted this, you know, the consequence will be that a director who has subject to a director banning notice will likely be subject to a director banning notice in due course. So, you know, it, it, as I say, the funding is a major issue. Um, there's no additional funding and there's no additional ability to pursue these matters, particularly when, you know, Phoenix entities don't have any assets in it, don't have an ability for a liquidator to push, then it's just not going to encourage a liquidator to go ahead and do so. Um, another key point, as you may have noticed from our previous um, review of the legislation that it was introduced in February, it doesn't actually mention the words Phoenix activity anywhere in the new legislation. Creditor related dispositions, et cetera, et cetera. It's, um, you know, the words Phoenix aren't there. Um, you can't point to a specific piece of legislation and say, well, this is it. There is some argument to suggest, well, the reason why that's not there is because the activities of Phoenixing are related to legitimate company turnaround. But, you know, it's not exactly a, a strong argument, I would dare suggest. Um, the Law Council of Australia actually issued a very long and very detailed response to the government um, in relation to the proposed legislation, as I say, this is these criticisms have been around for a long time um, and have been known for a long time. Um, and there were a number of suggestions that the legislation um, or the Lord, Lord Council of Australia wanted to see. Um, and for those of you who know insolvency administrators, you know, really the reality is what we deal with is the law. We do deal with accounting standards and whatever else, but it's it's corporations law. Um, so one of the major issues was protection for adverse cost orders against liquidators um, who take Phoenix action against directors in good faith. Um, you know, as I say, a key issue. I can't, you know, I cannot go to my bosses as uh, to my partners and say, well, we should put ourselves on the hook for 200 grand worth of costs if we lose this transaction um, in order to pursue this matter on the basis that, you know, there's something that we don't know because there's a lack of records, which there usually is in um, a finishing situation. You know, it just doesn't happen. I can't do that. Um, 
liquidators are subject to potential adverse cost orders in a number of different fields. And, you know, for me to go to my boss and say, hey, look, do you want to put, you know, another 200 grand of your money on the table to recover this when we may or may not get it back? You know, there's a good possibility that the director doesn't have any money left. Um, there's a possibility that some piece of record comes out of the woodwork somewhere down the line that they use to try to, um, yeah, defend the proceedings, um, say safe harbour provisions, you know, are you going to expose yourself to all those sorts of things? They're just not going to do it. End of story. So one of the, as I say, one of the suggestions had been that there would be some degree of protection available to liquidators. That hasn't been accepted. Um, very similarly, where we could prove that there was a, a a disposition of assets for undervalue within a certain period of time and that disposition went to a related party, then the onus of proof would be upon the director or the related party to show that those assets were actually transferred at fair market value. Um, again, that hasn't been accepted. It again remains upon our shoulders to um, prove that um, and also to prove that the transaction either occurred when the company was insolvent or likely to become insolvent or became insolvent as a result of the transaction. Again, all costs that have to be incurred by the liquidator in terms of taking steps before they even get to that liquidation um, or the, that litigation step. Um, uh, and then um, the other one of the other issues was that um, the legislation is too broad in terms of um, you know, the reasonable possibility that a market value was paid um, makes it very easy for somebody to sort of sit there and say, well, within X, Y, Z set of circumstances and the fact that I didn't market it to, you know, everybody and this and that and the other, um, it was a reasonable market value. Whereas, you know, with the benefit of hindsight, you sort of sit there and say, well, yeah, it was a market value provided that you didn't actually provide it, uh, make it available to the market. Um, so, you know, the um, Law Council um, also um, made uh, a number of comments that the phrasing of procuring, inciting, inducing and encouraging from third parties um, was way too broad um, and effectively had the position that um, it was almost a contractual term the third party had to um, make the suggestion um, regarding phoenixing activity to the part to the company, and the company effectively had to accept that that was the position. And a liquidator needs to effectively sit there and say, "Well, there was this offer of how this process should occur, um, and that that was accepted by the company." Um, they effectively just wanted to, the law, law council wanted to say, look, knowingly assist or be knowingly concerned. So if um, I was an advisor and I was advising a company and they were pursuing activities that fell within the phoenixing position and I, knowing with my degree of expertise, had a knowing knowledge of this, then I could be held um, liable for the offence. Um the other thing, and it, you know, again, touches back to something else, is the need for the liquidator to prove insolvency, um, as at the time that the transaction occurred, or as a result of the transaction. Particularly in the case where, as I say, in the majority of Phoenix enterprises, we're left with a company that has no money, um, has no records, has no nothing else. You know, very often. As part of phoenixing activity, books and records will be sold to the new entity and will be denied access. Um, so, you know, it, it makes it very, very difficult, very, very costly for a liquidator to pursue that, to establish insolvency as the first step to going ahead and dealing with credit defeating transactions. Um, and again, you know, we get back to the funding issue. There's no funding or a lack thereof. We're unlikely to go down the costly steps of trying to um, prove that and if nobody's going to prove it then nobody's going to take the prosecution in relation to it so further on for that 
what are the possible future legislation that may or may not be introduced um, in order to deal with this particular issue? Well, in relation to that, um, I think there have been a number of uh, proposals that have been floated by the government and by regulatory bodies um, and look like they will eventually come into play. Some of these will, some of these probably won't, um, to be perfectly frank with you. Um, establishment of director identification numbers is probably something that will come into, into um, practice sooner or later. Um, one of the major issues is that, you know, it's way too easy to become a director of a company and to establish a company um, and for your details to be slightly different in the registry and effectively not be picked up um, across different um, different entities that you may be a director of. Um, in terms of penalising people who continue to undertake this activity, having a director identification number, being able to see the regular activity that these people undertake um, is a key factor. Establishing the next off the uh, next cab off the rank system to appointing liquidators. To be honest with you, I don't really see this happening. Um, the system did exist to a certain degree um, historically, um, and you know the position. The argument is is that if it's an next cab off the rank system. There's no way that you can go to a particular liquidator um, on the basis that they'll overlook, um, you know, your phoenixing operations or, or your other offences. Look, the reality is is that the majority of liquidators aren't involved in this particular issue. We've got way too many regulators looking at us. We can't afford to be involved in these particular issues. Um, you know. Plenty of the prosecution that's occurred recently, the guys on the Gold Coast, um, you know, the Whitman matter, they were all actions of liquidators taking steps with ASIC and going to ASIC and saying, hey, there's a problem here in relation to a job that I've been appointed to, whether that be directly from those parties or whether that be through a liquidation process. So... I find it difficult to think that the government is going to go back to, uh, you know, a rough system of what it was historically. And the reality is, is that I don't really think it's going to make a major change. The reality is that liquidators themselves, there are some for sure, but the vast majority of the 700 and something liquidators that are registered, um, you know, 99% of them aren't involved in actually doing this phoenixing and, and, earning a business from um, facilitating furnishing activities. Um, as part of the director of identification numbers, there's the next step of identifying high risk individuals, those individuals who've done this before and increasing um, subject in there to increasing monitoring and penalties. That could include limitation that they aren't able to be directors of any more than a handful of companies. Um, they may have to put up a bond in relation to outstanding tax liabilities. Um, there are a number of different um, uh, associated things that might be the case. Um, the Australian Labor Party has um, proposed that should they get into Parliament in, uh, as a result of the next uh, general election, that they would uh, have a publicly listed um, uh, uh, source that people could go to that would publicly identify uh, directors who are either suspected or accused of uh, engaging in phoenixing activity. Um, so, you know, identifying those individuals and making them responsible to a new level um, of monitoring, um, limiting their ability to become involved, um, it, is is certainly um, something that I think is is quite possible. Um, particularly, we do have a do have an economic downturn, and there is that disassociation with relation to the entities that we liquidate and the recoveries that we can get from those entities. Um, allowing other regulators to pursue disqualification, such as uh, fair work, uh, fair trading, the office of uh, sorry, the Australian Taxation Office. Um, I think it's something that's likely to come in at some point in time. Again, um, quite driven if, if there is a downturn. 
Um, you know, look, the more parties that are available to do it, so long as they have funding to assist liquidators in being able to pursue that matter, 100% for. We just need more funding to be able to do it. That's really where it gets to. Um, increasing penalties for books and records failures, 110% behind that. Whether that happens or not um, is difficult to tell. Um, you know, really, the reality is if you want to be able to prosecute these actions and if you're going to impose upon us the need to prove insolvency in order to do so, we need um, a degree of, uh, you know, a degree of force behind, you know, circumstances where there are no books and records. And it's not just an issue of historically or, or whatever else. You know, I've got companies at the moment where, you know, the company deliberately stopped accounting for stock or, you know, certain asset movements six months prior to the liquidation. It knew it was in financial trouble. It stopped doing the accounting system for its stock um, simply so they could go off and sell the business to a, to another entity and not, you know, have me be able to come and buy as liquidator and say, well, hang on, you sold the stock at, at undervalue. Stock records completely gone, completely destroyed. Um, you know, I can tell that, you know, five years ago, oh, sorry, you know, 12 months prior to liquidation, there was $5 million worth of stock. I know it was sold 12 months later for three for $300,000. And the argument that the two parties are, you know, putting to me is, well, hey, look, you know, we diminished our stock a whole heap. It was written off a whole heap of it was obsolete, whatever else. But they deliberately, and I know it, deliberately stopped um, accounting for it. So, um, you know, stock takes, all the rest of it, they all stopped. Um, and that's a relatively common um, position um, and effectively makes it impossible for me to take insolvent trading action against the company because I can't sit there and say, well, you know, here's a reasonable position as to why um, the stock was worth significantly more than what it was that you actually paid for it. So um, that's something that I would totally support, whether or not it occurs is a different question. Um, requiring asset transfers between related parties to be supported by independent valuations. Again, I, I'm unlikely to see that particular issue. Um, strengthening provisions of 596AB, as we discussed, um, a provision that exists within the Corporations Act as it stands, existed prior to the new legislation coming in in 2017, never been used. Um, one thing that I am I'm extremely supportful for and hopefully will end up seeing is an increase of the maximary statutory fine for breaches of directors' duties currently. Um, basically, any breach of director's duties is maximally subject to a penalty of 2,000 penalty units, which is around about $400,000. It changes a little bit. Um, but in instances where there's, say, things like market manipulation or insider trading um, or inducement to trade based on false information, well, that those particular offences are actually subject to um, penalties of 4,500 penalty units, which is far closer to a million dollars. So, you know, to have direct penalty units, or breaches of direct um, duties increase to that level um, makes it, uh, you know, something that people actually want to consider um, doing when you're going to potentially be fined a million dollars for you know, taking steps, hell of a lot different than being fined 400, the maximum of 400,000 in reality, significantly less than that. Um, you know, there was an instance recently in Melbourne where a particular party ran a cleaning company, didn't pay employee entitlements, didn't do a whole heap of other things, um, put the company into liquidation, you know, then transferred out the assets, you know, is effectively trading with the same clients, all the rest of it, in a new entity, were taken to court and were fined, I believe, nineteen thousand dollars plus another twenty or thirty thousand dollars on top of that for various other issues. Grand total of fifty thousand dollar fine. They got out of paying hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of credit liabilities. So why wouldn't you do it? Um, 
one of the other provisions is potentially penalizing people based on um, multiples of the income gained as a result of their misfeasance. Um, there is also a potential of sort of sitting there and saying, well, if you've transferred assets into this new entity and this new entity is trading and earns an income as a result of it, then that new entity should have to pay those the income, the revenue, the profit that it earns during that period of time with your assets or with the old company's assets, and it should pay it back to the liquidator. So, yeah, I'd love to say all those sorts of things. Anything that increases the penalty, the obligation of people um, in relation to what they're actually doing um, is something that I'd like to see. Whether or not that actually happens, different question. So that's it. Um, the end of uh, my presentation on Phoenixing. Um, it will be a problem that will continue to go on. Um, it won't be solved by the current legislation. Current legislation, it's a nice set, but yeah, you know, it's a it's a very um, it's a very small step without funding. Really, at the end of the day, it's not going to have a great impact. Um, as I say, I suspect that it's going to require an actual insolvency event, a, a, a downturn, or a recession, a series of insolvencies where um, the expectation of creditors, in terms of what they're actually going to recover, is significantly less than what actually happens. Um, and until that time happens, you know, we're just going to tinker around at the edges in relation to this particular matter. You know, and that um, that conclusion is supported by you know evidence of the changes that have been made to phoenixing or phoenixing type transactions in the United States, in Ireland, in the UK. Um, they're all areas where the systems were greatly strengthened following um, the GFC um, and you know the subsequent downturn in Ireland. Um, it's really those particular issues. They need to you need to see a um, a significant change. Uh, between what people's expectations are and what actually happens. So um, if you have any questions, feel free to contact me. Um, my details are um, there. Um, uh, Andrew, um, in relation to... Um, Yeah, GST is a, an unsecured liability, but effectively the way in which the new legislation um, the new legislation is effectively in, in making it a priority legislation effectively or a priority liability um, to a certain degree um, by making um, people personally liable for it. Um, the as i say the position is that the government has taken is effectively that as a director when you sell goods and services you know you have an obligation to remit one tenth of what you receive as income to the tax office as a liability um and what these phoenix operators do um, is that they fail to do so they put the company in a liquidation and they have that liability um, and so the view would be that you know, you have an obligation to do that. You've collected that money that really should end up in the pockets of the tax office. Um, and so therefore that's the reason why you would be made personally liable for that, but not for other obligations. Um, and really what you say there about obtaining a proper valuation to avoid the problem and pay consideration. Well, look, that's the reality of the circumstance. That's how you get around it. Um, that is the defense to uh, director related uh, or sorry creditor defeating transactions have a valuation a proper valuation that as I say considers all the particular options um, and all the particular circumstances including things like goodwill um, prior to um, proceeding with this particular uh, proceeding with the with a transfer if you do that then you're within the same terms of you know, what would be decided as, as a standard turnaround procedure. You'd be capable of, you know, coverage under the safe harbour provisions, a whole heap of other things would, would come into place. The fact that you don't obtain a, a valuation or you obtain a dodgy valuation 
um, as the case may be, or evaluation that, you know, what isn't dodgy doesn't consider the entirety of the circumstance, that's where you um, will become liable pursuant to the credit of defeating transaction provisions. Um, and that's where a whole heap of arguments are going to go on between liquidators and bailers and directors as to whether the appropriate consideration was made um, for the value of the asset. Um, so, yeah. As I say, if you have any further questions, by all means, give me a call. Um, my contact details um, are 3228-4260. Um, or by email, more than happy to discuss the issue. Um, this uh, presentation will be stored and made available if you need to go back and refer to it. Thank you very much for your time. Um, I hope this was somewhat interesting. Um, yeah, one of the most frustrating parts of insolvency from a practical perspective. So, you know, welcome to my pain. Uh, outside of that, have yourselves a great afternoon. Um, and look after yourselves. Thank you.